I want to um, give you a bit of a discussion here about Act 2, Scene 1 from Translations. Uh, the purpose of this really is to explore this, uh, me this way of connecting conventions and meaning in, uh, in the writing that you do about the play. Um, so the aims here are to develop your understanding that the conventions of drama aren't about finding some hidden code or formula for unlocking meaning. Rather, understanding the convention of conventions of drama is about using a shared language for talking about theatre, for being able to acknowledge the work of the playwright, the director, the actor, and others, and the meaning or meanings that you draw from the play. And I want to be able to demonstrate ways of incorporating discussion of dramatic conventions in ways that avoid formulae. And so let's start with something of a list of conventions. Uh, listing conventions when it comes to drama is problematic. Uh, students of literature and students of drama, they'll look at it, the play using subtly different discourses. In part, when in literature we're often looking at the printed text and, uh, and what's included there. And in drama you might be looking more at the performance text. And so some of the language for how we discuss that has some subtle variations. But the items that are here on the screen now uh, are in common to both. Narrative, dramatic irony, language, characterization, imagery, dialogue, structure and costume, stage directions which can fan out into a whole discussion of various uh, areas of uh, dramatic convention. But in using these conventions in an essay, there are three rules that I want you to follow. Number one, always be answering the question that you're given. Rule number two, always be answering the question. And rule number three, choose the convention that most loudly reveals the meaning of the scene in relation to that question. So in coming back to these uh, conventions above, when you're looking at a scene and trying to connect that to your question, you'll find that only one or two of these conventions will resonate really loudly with what you're doing. And that's what I hope to kind of demonstrate here in relation to Act 2, Scene 1. And so what I've given you here are three ideas that might stimulate some, uh, some thinking about the scene. So these are what I think resonate in the scene. There would be many who would disagree. This is just a starting point. Or when I say disagree, I mean that there are other possible readings. Act 2, Scene 1 reveals the colonization of Irish culture by renaming the landscape. And in presenting this, there's a link between language and identity. But also, what emerges in this scene is this, uh, the introduction of the relationship between Mara and Yolland. And so, these are three kind of starting point ideas here that could yield some interesting discussion. And so, arguably, again, as I've said already, all the conventions are at work in this scene. But I think the ones that I've pointed out below they kind of resonate a bit more loudly, particularly in relation to the meanings that I identify. The use of the map in the name book as props early in the scene uh, have symbolic meaning that could be worth discussing. The use of stage directions, specifically the entrances, the eg entrances and exits, as well as acting direction, strongly guide the audience to the ideas that uh, Friel's foregrounding. And then there's language. English, Gaelic and Latin share the stage in a scene for important effect. And so if we take the uh, opening of the scene and look at how, um, how Friel has designed the set or given directions to a director for two things that need to be on stage. Firstly, there's a makeshift clothesline and secondly, there's a map. I think this is really important that he uh, puts these two side by side. And so what I've done here on the right of screen is written a bit of a sample paragraph for how you might connect uh, some of the ideas of the play to the uh, use of um, staging directions here. The opening of Act 2 places both the magnitude of the powerful and the powerlessness of the colonized in plain sight of the audience and it is the subtle language of staging that accomplishes this. In the stage directions for the first scene, Friel presents the audience with the makeshift clothesline stage right, sharing the stage with a large map spread out on the floor. The symbolism lies in the gap between their meaning, 
That is, the simple clothesline signifies the simplicity of the Irish. Against this is cast a similarly simple map. Yet the power of this document to shape the lives of the Irish will become the driving force of the play. Now there are, uh, there are criticisms of the writing here, but what I'm trying to demonstrate here is how you can incorporate a discussion of conventions and connecting it with meaning in ways that aren't necessarily about clear formula through the convention of staging kind of statements that are just plain ugly in writing, in my opinion. Now, the use of exits and entrances is a, cr a critical feature of this uh, scene, and it's one that's easily overlooked. And so let's have a look at Manus's uh, exit, of you know, temporary exit during the scene. So in this part, we have Manus uh, saying to Owen, I understand uh, the Lancies perfectly, but people like you puzzle me. And then Manus uh, turns to Yolan and asks him how their work is going. And Yolan comments that they'd be lost without Roland. And then we have Manus leaving. I'm sure, but there are always the Rolands, aren't there? And then he goes upstairs and exits. So in this, what I think is important here is that Manus leaving and saying that line leaves it hanging with the audience. Because this idea of the Rolands as collaborators, perhaps, or even so far as traders, is something that would resonate particularly with a guild hall audience in Derry in the first performance. And so again, I'm going to uh, show you some ways to write about that in ways that I hope uh, aren't formulaic. One of the interesting character journeys in translations is that of Owen, and it is in Act 2, Scene 1, that his character comes into question. To this point in the play, it is uncertain whether Owen is a naive dupe to the English colonial project or something of a collaborator, some might say traitor. When Manus asks Yoland about the progress of their work, Yoland praises the help of Roland, to which Manus responds, but there are always the Rolands, aren't there? This is a stinging rebuke of Owen and points to a larger comment about colonialism, and it is noteworthy that this line is delivered as Manus exits, drawing focus to the utterance. Here, Friel, through Manus, is pointing to the way England's colonisation of Ireland was not simply a military invasion, rather it was made possible by the Rolands, the local Irish who tacitly supported their presence. In terms of the play, Manus's rebuke points to Owen's growing acceptance of the true force of English colonialism and his part in it. And so looking back over this paragraph, what I'd just like to draw your attention to here is the connection that's been made here between the uh, entrances and exits and the idea of um, Owen being part of England's colonialism. It's supported by a quote and is an explanation of the quote that's in this uh, sample paragraph. But another uh, set of entrances and exits that is that connects to the ideas of the play is in the use of Hugh. And so later in this scene, uh, we see Hugh uh, engage, uh, arriving just at the moment when Yoland is bemoaning the fact that he can't really speak the language. He says, I may learn the password, but the language of the tribe will always elude me. Now, Hugh is the intellectual heart of the play. Uh, one might even say he's the ideological heart of the play if you wanted to go that far. But Yolan's desire to speak the language of the tribe seems to invoke the entrance of Hugh. It's almost like an invitation. And so Hugh emerges, and immediately he's speaking Latin, this other language. So right now we have three languages in operation here, Gaelic, English, and Latin. And so then further down, we have this discussion here of Wordsworth and a bit of, I guess, dramatic irony in the sense that uh, the, the, uh, the characters have no sense of the magnitude of Wordsworth. It's there for comedic effect or comic effect. But then we have Hugh a little further on here talking about the richness of, uh, of the Gaelic language, the richness of the Irish language. And he points to the role of language in Irish culture as somehow a compensation for the harshness of the physical life being lived there. Where he says... Um, 
certain cultures expend on their vocabularies and syntax, acquisitive energies and ostentations entirely lacking in their material lives. And this is furthered a little f a bit further down here. It is our response to mud caverns and a diet of potatoes, our only method of replying to inevitabilities. But I want to draw your attention to where Hugh leaves. Where he leaves the scene here, he invokes the work of George Steiner, a literary critic who wrote a lot about, uh, about the role of language in shaping identity. And I want to point you to this quote where he says that words are signals, counters, they are not immortal. And it can happen, to use an image you'll understand, it can happen that a civilization can be imprisoned in a linguistic contour which no longer matches the landscape of fact. This is almost verbatim from George Steiner. So Hughes' exit leaves the audience with one of the play's most prominent ideas, the, la the danger of Ireland becoming stuck in images of a lost past. And so again, with the pattern of this, what I'm trying to do in this video for you is to show you how this could work in a paragraph. As the intellectual heart of the play, Hughes serves as Friel's expression of the work of George Steiner and his entrances and exits work to foreground these ideas. Steiner's idea that a civilization can be trapped in linguistic contour is used almost verbatim in translations. In 2.1, Yolland seemingly invokes Hugh when he says, I may learn the password, but the language of the tribe will always elude me. Hugh's entrance at this point brings the relationship between language, identity and belonging to the foreground. Indeed, Hugh accounts for the acquisitive energies and ostentations of the Irish language as a response to the harshness of life in rural Ireland, as a response to inevitabilities. Yet his final lines before his exit from the scene resonates most loudly. Here, Hugh invokes Friel's reading of Steiner, his warning that words are signals, counters, and that a civilization can be trapped in a linguistic contour which no longer matches the landscape of fact is central to the play. Indeed, 2.1 highlights the beginnings of the process by which the very landscape of Ireland would be foreign to its own people and Gaelic would become an irrelevant language in its own land. Now this is, um, this is making this connection between Hugh's entrance here and the wider ideas. That it's through the strategy of having uh, Hugh enter the stage at that particular point that um, that Friel is using his craft as a playwright to uh, to foreground this idea. Again, talking about these entrances and exits, uh, I want to finally talk about Mara and her uh, entrance because it has significant implications for the uh, for the action in the play. So here we have Mara entering with her can of milk. And this is just after Manus has uh, announced that he's secured a well-paying teaching job at Inishman. And he's expecting to be able to marry Mara. We found this out in Act 1, where she, we learned that she's planning to go to America. But only because he, she can't rely on him to be able to support her and she needs to figure things out for herself. But his exit signals the end of that relationship, or that hope because it becomes immediately apparent that the love story of the play will indeed play out between Mara and Yoland. It's interesting, I see that when Manus uh, leaves and runs up the stairs, he, as he's going, says, how will you like living on an island? But it, his words are completely ignored. There's no response to that. We just simply then have Mara and Yoland uh, meeting each other. And so here's why we could write about this. Friel's use of entrances as a dramatic technique is significant not only as a means of foregrounding ideas and themes, but as a means of shifting the focus of the narrative. Mara's entrance in 2.1 seems to, in the, in the moment of the play, a relatively minor event, but its ramifications for the narrative are enormous. Coming immediately after Manus' announcement of his new job, the audience has been placed to see this as his op as his Manus's opportunity to find love with Myra. Instead, this scene is the beginning of her relationship with Yoland. What is significant in this play is that most of the action takes place off stage. So it is the entrances and exits of characters that signify the key transitions of ideas and, and narrative. And so to summarize what we've done here, 
and hopefully in the course of this video you have noticed a couple of the typographical errors that I've made in the paragraphs. Hopefully you haven't picked up on those, but now I've gone and announced them. But to summarize, dramatic conventions are there to be discussed as part of an analysis of plays. They're not a shopping list of ideas. They're there to stimulate a shared language between you, the critic, and markers or any readers of your writing about the play. And discussion of conventions can be weaved into a discussion of the ideas without being a formula. So I'm happy to take questions in our next class, gentlemen, but uh, hopefully this has given you some help and hopefully we can see some good, seamless, interesting, vibrant writing from you all.